So thank you guys for being here. We're excited to do this again, and I'll turn it over to Ken now. Thank you, Jill. Okay, so this week we're talking about um, Harold and Lillian, a Hollywood love story, which it, it really is in, in several ways a Hollywood love story. Um, I put this film in between two films that are probably a little bit more, you might say controversial, but I would say a little more um, difficult. You take a little bit more to, to, to get into. This is a really, I think, very likable film. Um, and also informative in telling you about some of the things that go on in Hollywood that probably people don't know about the people behind the scenes. So let's just open it up to anybody who has sort of um, general reactions to the film, and then we'll get into the specifics and talk about the um, questions. Um, hopefully everybody got the intro sheet that had some questions in background. If not, I'll go over them when we get to that point. So anybody have a comment? General comment? I do. Okay. I thought, this is at the end of the movie, but I thought the wife was so brave and heroic, the way she talked about her, her husband and the work that she did. I thought she was a marvel, that's all. She just turned, um, I think, 92 in June. Yep, 92 in June. So she's, she's still there. She lives at the motion picture home. In, in California, so. Ken, all I, want, all I want out of life are candy hose that don't run. <laughs> it's a the light, the film was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Go ahead. I thought the film was just fabulous. Um, yes, very easy to get into. I felt like they needed more acclaim for what they did. They really were in the shadows. And I guess if you're not like deeply ingrained in the film industry, you probably never would have heard of them. Um, and I think that what happened to her, I mean, he had a skill with the storyboards, but she just sort of fell into it. And it was the kind of thing that if you tried to get into that, you probably never could. But because she yeah. didn't really try, she, she became, a pretty big deal. Well, you know, there are certainly no Oscars for the fields that they're in. Um, well, at the beginning, at, at least the storyboard field for Harold. Later on, he actually did get nominated for two Oscars. But um, they're what's called in Hollywood below the line. There's above the line and below the line, and it has to do with the budget. And everybody below the line gets paid but doesn't get any credit on the screen for it. And they were definitely below the line people, no credits for the work that they did, other than other industry people possibly knowing um, what they did. Um, Harold did actually get uh, um, an Academy Award nomination when he switched over to doing production design, which is you know beyond the storyboard. And he did that on Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, and then he got a second nomination for art direction on the on terms of endearment. So he did get more recognition than um, Lillian. Um, he has a Wikipedia entry. Lillian doesn't have one. I may have to create a Lillian Wikipedia entry so that she gets some credit. Um, and one other tribute for them. I don't know if I can quickly share screen here on mine, but um, if you see the movie Shrek 2, Harold and Lillian are the king and queen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> which, which is kind of sweet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, that has to do with the fact that um, the library that has Lillian's name on it has moved many times, it turns mm -hmm. out. Um, it started out, I wrote the little history here, it begins at, at the Goldwyn lot um, where she volunteered when she started out. Um, then it moved when they bumped it out of there, they moved it to the American Film Institute's basement. And then Francis Ford Coppola asked her to bring it over to his Zoetrope Studios. Um, and it was kind of the, the center of the, of the Zoetrope Studios, kind of a hangout kind of place. But Zoetrope kind of went under um, and it got moved to Paramount. And it finally ended up at DreamWorks, um, which is why she got into Shrek because Apparently it was a big hangout. People would come over. And at that point, Harold was 
not doing so well, couldn't work anymore. He was definitely retired and he was having a lot of issues. So she would bring him to work and the animators would come in and talk to him about Hollywood and drawing and stuff like that. Um, so he became, both of them became good friends of the DreamWorks people. And so then they were able to uh, do a little tribute for them by putting them into Shrek. The library at the moment, is housed at the Art Directors Guild. And it's not actually open for people to go in, but you can do some online research. So they're still looking for funding from what I saw online. So that's that on that one. Anyone else with some general comments or something? So they were a phenomenal couple that um, expressed their creativity in ways that probably would not it kind of indicated to me they wouldn't care whether they got an award or not for anything that they did, that it was kind of ingrained in their character and their personality to be the people that they were. And I found it totally enthralling. And uh, I love the, the opening with the book, with all of the cards that Harold had made for Lillian. I mean, it was truly a love story and truly a, um, a good glimpse into what creative people do and how they uh, live their life. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm going to jump from that comment to um, question four. <laughs> Start at the end here. So it, I asked, Harold died in 2007. He was 87. Lillian, 92, was interviewed throughout the film. Her stories are what bring the personal story of the Mickelson's life. Did you feel the film was able to blend their personal and professional stories successfully? I found very little criticism of this film that had negative things to say. One of them though said that it should have focused on the Hollywood work and the personal life really shouldn't have been, that's a different film kind of thing, which I don't know that people agree with, but that was one of the criticisms. Other people I think probably like the fact that it mixed those two things. And that's why it's a Hollywood love story. It's about Hollywood but it's also a love story, their love, their love of Hollywood, but also obviously their love of themselves and family. Um, any comments about the personal and professional stories mix? I have one. Okay. It was, um, I think they left out the relationship. Why was he close to Danny DeVito? Um, there, there weren't a lot of um, integral links in terms of his relationship to Hollywood people. Um, and also their domestic life was rather superficial, but informative and uh, about her children, that was informative. I liked it a lot. I thought it was very well done, but I would have liked to know why only Danny, Danny DeVito was a close friend. I'm sure he was close friends with lots of people. Then the other thing I thought was fascinating, and I love that you chose this, um, I always wondered who did all the research on these period movies. And mm. I absolutely love them all, um, especially the one with, oh God, my memory's so bad, but Revolutionary Road or something, I, I forget the name of it, with DiCaprio, mm -hmm. it was a 60s movie, and I thought, God, that was wonderful research and I always wondered who did all that research and the drawings that he did were incredible. I mean, yeah. I, I wonder if anyone can do a film without someone doing a storyboard. Yeah, there are, there are directors who don't like storyboards. And, um, you know, it's interesting because he, he worked with Hitchcock quite a bit and Hitchcock apparently always said that, you know, he's bored when he goes on set because he's already seen the whole film in his head. He knows what the shots are going to look like and everything. But of course, if somebody was drawing storyboards for him, that's actually what he was seeing. And if you looked at like the, um, the one for the birds and things like that, those shots are almost exact what Harold's storyboards are. So um, I don't want to jump into the um, contributions there. Let me stick with the professional and personal stories. I thought the most interesting story that popped up there was about their older son. Um, is that yes. Alan? Yeah, Alan, with, who had autism. Yes. And in the early 50s, um, you know, that was like a non-issue. Right. That was not something anybody talked about. I, I found it actually kind of shocking that when she went to this group or talked with the doctors, they called them refrigerator mothers. 
with the idea that they were so cold, these women, that that's why their children have these problems. I thought, oh my God, there's a, there's a little documentary right there that you could yeah. do. That's unbelievable. And it, it turns out that Alan ends up going to college, becomes a computer programmer. Um, I, I taught at NJIT and we had a number of students that were autistic and computer programming was one of the big areas they mm -hmm. went into because they could focus for hours. Mm -hmm. You almost had to rip them away from the computer. They would focus for hours with no distractions on the code and things like that. So I thought that was a very interesting aspect of their life. Now you could say, what does that have to do with, with their work in Hollywood? Well, I, I don't know that it does. So if you think that's a flaw that they mix those two things, then I guess that's evidence of it. But I actually, I enjoyed it. I'm not sure they would have had enough to do the whole film if they just focused on the film work, but you know, it's possible. I, I, think, yeah. I just think that the most, I just think that the fascinating thing about uh, something biographical is the fact that they humanize them by putting in the personal life. And I think that reading about any star, their rise to stardom or whatever it is, well, that's one part of it. But then when they talk about all the foibles that they go through that are the same as ours, you know, it's, um, it becomes far more fascinating. You can identify with it better, I think. Yeah. I mean, some parts of, the, of their biographies certainly tie into it. I mean, the fact that how Lillian ended up in Hollywood and how she just like volunteered at this library and it became an actual job. I mean, you kind of had to know that to, to know, like as, as someone said, you know, I didn't even know, you know, who does this research? You know, where do they go for these kinds of things? And even though she did a lot of formal research, you know, looking in books and things like that. I, I love the little story, but now I'm jumping into contribution, but I like the little story of um, Fiddler on the Roof, where she went out on the street and just talked to these women and said, what kind of underwear would they have been wearing back then and everything? I mean, she did research in all different kinds of ways. Apparently the reason the library currently doesn't really have a home is because we don't research in the same ways anymore. You know, now with the internet and digital files, a lot of people do their own research and the studios don't rely as much on individuals doing research for them. So it's kind of fallen away a little bit. Um, anything else on their personal lives and the way he mixed the personal and the professional? I, um, I think not enough credit has been given to, uh, to her because when she was growing up, she lived in an orphanage and had a pretty rough life. Yeah. But she was able to make such a success of herself that I think that is something that doesn't get enough credit. I think she did a wonderful job. But one thing that I didn't quite get was when they were, they weren't officially dating when he decided to go to California mm -hmm. and she followed him. They didn't really explain it very well, so I didn't quite get it. I, and, you know, just the idea that she would get on a bus and go to California to go and meet this guy and ostensibly, you know, get married to him. I don't think there was like a, a pre-marriage dating going on. I, you know, I was just hoping somebody could maybe express some clarification. Actually, what I loved about it, what she said was, um, I said we could live together and then we'd see if we wanted to get married or not. And I thought, oh my God, in night, what was that, 1940? That that was such a, a, an outstanding, uh, crazy thing to say because who would be doing that at that time? You know, people were so prim and proper about getting together and all of that. And mm -hmm. all of that eccentric part of her personality and the way, you know, that I, I just think it was wonderful the way that she uh, told the story and, and how her mother-in-law hated her. And so she really wanted this guy then because she was going to, you know, stand up. So she was so feisty all through that, you know, I really enjoyed that part of it. I love the storytelling. It was a tribute to her husband, but by telling the story, she let us know what a strong person she was and how much we have to admire her for her, what she did. I think the fact that she had no real family, I think drew her towards him and, you know, having 
another family to go to and starting your own family and that sort of thing. I, I think that was a factor, although I don't know that that's actually stated in the film. That, w that was my sense of it. And it, it's interesting that you, you say that, you know, if the film kind of focuses on Harold, although she gets all the screen time, obviously, because she's the one who's alive and telling the story. But even in the film, Harold gets way more attention than Lillian as far as achievements. Just like in real life, he got more attention with Oscar nominations and things like that and was able to move up in the industry to another position where um, she pretty much stayed, you know, in the same kind of position, moving from place to place, you know, getting kind of thrown out of her own library and things like that from location to location. So, you know, that's a kind of curious thing. All right, another question Can that I, I asked no. and hopefully people have different responses to. Oh, somebody has something? Yes, can I just say something yes. about the question? Oh, uh, yeah. The, yeah. The, um, I think the film should have been two films. And to me, the interesting part was the professional aspect uh, because we all go to see movies, we all go, to, um, and we admire all the Shah, we don't know much about what goes in the background and to see how easy and really nicer this guy with his incredible talent made these films. You know, they show us a little bit more and more. I mean, obviously they had to limit, you know, a, a movie had to be of a certain time and they wanted, they made a decision, the, the, uh, the filmmakers to include both in, in, in this film, but I would have loved to have watched two hours of his work, you know, because it's, it is the visual thing and, and filmmaking is a visual thing and to see it in your eyes and comparing it to frames from the films was just an eye opening. So mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen more of that love story it was fine. You know, you love it and all that sort of thing. But for, for me, the interesting part about this film was his life. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to respond to that by jumping up to the first question and talk a little bit about the filmmaker, because he, he sort of has already done what you asked for. Um, you'll just have to search for his other film. Um, so Daniel Rame is the filmmaker, and um, he said he had about 50 hours of interviews, and he selected what he thought was essential and put together, you know, a five-hour cut, rough cut, and then edited it down to get it under two, two hours. So we don't know what ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, and what would you have liked to have seen? Well, that can come up in all the questions we have, but a little background on him as a documentary filmmaker. He's actually been working in this same sort of little area for three films now. He did a, uh, well, first of all, he met Harold when he was taking classes at the American Film Institute. And Harold was asked to come in and talk about the storyboard process. And so he met Harold and thought, this guy's phenomenal and everything. And he decided he made a little short film, which actually got nominated for an Oscar called The Man on Lincoln's Nose, which is a very odd title. And I'm wondering if any film buffs up there know where that reference goes to. The Man on Lincoln's Nose. And I will give you a clue. Hitchcock. Rushmore. North Not Rushmore, Northwest. but, well, Mount Rushmore, right? right. North by Northwest. Yeah. Right, right. So North, North, he, he did this short film, and it's, it's actually about production design. And um, he interviews a, a couple of people that um, were involved in production design in Hollywood, um, one of them being a guy named Boyle, who did a lot of Hitchcock films, including North by Northwest. And if you've ever seen North by Northwest, there's a scene you know, where they're on the side of Mount Rushmore and they're climbing on Mount Rushmore and stuff. And Hitchcock, you know, didn't get permission to actually film there. So they had to build sets. So the production designer had to put this together. And Hitchcock wanted the joke of, um, he wanted Cary Grant to be under like someone's nose, like George Washington's nose and have to sneeze. He thought that would be a funny gag and it never got into the film. So he did this little short film and it got good press and got nominated. So he decided to do a longer film in 2010 called Something's Gonna Live, which is about um, six people, production designers, cinematographers, and Harold. So he's kind of been through this territory before. So the, the film that you're asking him to do the other film, I think he did it. 
he did this other film. So it's called Something's Gonna Live. And what he did is he expanded on the short and focused mostly on the production designer, um, Robert Boyle, who did North by Northwest and Cape Fear and a lot of different things. He also included, like I said, Harold in there to talk about how storyboards build towards production design. And then the cinematographer looks at the storyboards and the production designs and decides how to line up shots and things like that. Um, and as we know, some of those shots are exact for his storyboards. So it starts there and, and builds its way up. Um, and Harold and, and Lillian premiered at the Doc New NYC Festival, which is a big documentary film festival. And it was at the Cannes Film Festival and their classics thing. It was on Turner Classic Movies Film Fest and, and a number of things. So it has gotten recognition, but he's definitely been in this territory before. He loves this whole idea of design. And that's kind of what he studied. So anybody else on that particular aspect? All right, so that's our filmmaker. I want to say something. So, hi. Okay, hi, hi. I really liked the mix. Um, I liked seeing the storyboards and how they portrayed actually what was happening, what, how he was designing and what the storyboards looked like. I liked that it had a backdrop of the tenacity of this couple and of this couple that where they talked about uh, love stories that really didn't particularly last in Hollywood, but here's a, a you know a, a couple that kind of made it work. I like I liked listening um, to you know the fact that she didn't have anything to lose to go with him. You know she was she had you know and you know she had come from an orphanage and I'm sure she had a lot of struggles there and it, it was a way for her to change her life and make something better for herself. But the other thing that really struck me was when they put up the movies that they were showing, I'm going, oh, I saw that, or I saw that, and I want to see that again, and oh my gosh, I didn't realize they were involved in this movie. There were so many movies there that, that it kind of prompted me to want to look at those movies again with the perspective of what was presented in this movie, because I really didn't know a lot about storyboards, or I didn't know a lot about you know, libraries like this. I had really no clue. And the fact that they were so careful about making sure, even if the storyline was more of a fantasy they talked about, that the, the details were going to be accurate, the historical details were going to be accurate, you know, if she had anything to do with it. Or if that, you know, so I, I was, it, 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 it was almost a, like a lot. I could see him picking out all these pieces to, to um, appeal to many aspects of the audience that was watching. Because I could see this piece happening. Oh my God, I want to go there. And this piece happening, I want to go there. And oh boy, I didn't know that. I really enjoyed the way it was put together. Yeah. Um, I read elsewhere that um, Lillian worked on 500 films. She contributed something to 500 films from the library. And they did actually work together on some films where he was doing storyboards and she was doing the research that he would use in the storyboards. Not always. But they did, to a degree, they worked together on those things. Um, and it, like I said, it really is a Hollywood love story in the Hollywood way, but also in, you know, just their, their pure love story kind of thing. Um, any, anything else about the filmmaker and um, what was kind of left on the cutting room floor? Are there other things that you wish you had seen more of? I have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I had one thing I was going to, you know, that really intrigued me a lot was how she actually developed or what her kind of collection development policy, for lack of a better term, was for the yeah. library, because there are absolutely no boundaries in terms of what people would ask her to research. I mean, yeah. you know, it could be anything from a temporal or a geographic or a subject perspective. And I just found it absolutely amazing, maybe because my background's a little bit in history and archives, that she had the flexibility to go into all those different fields and then accumulate this sort of subject based, what looked to me to be like a series of sort of vertical files, plus reference books, plus other kinds of things relating to basically anything. And anybody could ask her to do anything at any given period of time. So I just found that absolutely amazing. And I was curious about how she went about building that thing. I mean, it seemed to me like some of what she did or a lot of her research was kind of based on personal connections, knowing who to call up, getting information and that kind of thing. But I was just also interested in physically how she managed to construct that library, basically. And they didn't talk too much about that, but I found that really yeah. intriguing. 
Well, you know, I've, I've dug into them and the, and the films and things like that a little bit beyond. And so a lot of the things that I would say, oh, I wish they included that in the film are the things that I found later on. But again, you know, you have a limit about how much, like I said, he had a lot of hours of film that he didn't use. He probably could do another film or, or something if he wanted. But like one interesting little anecdote was there's a movie, um, I don't know if people have seen it called War Games. Um, and it was about a, um, Matthew Broderick is a teenager and he hacks into like the, um, the big network with the bombs and the nuclear war and everything. She was involved in that. And she had, as you're saying here, personal connection. She had a friend at the Pentagon that she had met working on another film and she was able to get, but it was kind of a con job, the director, Martin Brest, to be able to go to um, NORAD's Cheyenne Mountain, which is what was going to be in the film. That's the place where they control all the missiles for the United States and things like that. But it was kind of a con, like he was going to go there as a reporter for something else. They didn't say he was making a movie. Really what he was doing was trying to take mental notes on what he wanted designed for his set. So it would actually look like NORAD, which of course we're not supposed to know about and we don't go in there. Mm -hmm. um, and it came out later on that like, you know, how did you get this, so close to the, you know, the way the computers are set up at NORAD and the big screen and everything like that. And they, they did not get upset. It turned out they kind of let it go because they were movie fans too. But um, I think a lot of her stuff was personal connections. She knew somebody who knew somebody who could do something or she just asked people, you know, who lived through that time or from that country or whatever it happened to be. And, you know, some of the things, you know, your, your backgrounds in history, certainly, you know, she had to become a bit of an historian. I mean, she, she must have contacted some historians. If you're doing something like the Ten Commandments, you just don't wing it. <laughs> I mean, you say like, oh, I don't know, they probably would have wore this kind of headdress. Well, I'm sure there are actual headdresses we could look up and find out what the headdress would be. Um, so, you know, that's another thing. I, I wish a lot of these little anecdotes could be included, but, you know, there's only so much you can put in. But she was, she was very tenacious. I mean, you know, she really peeled that onion you know, I know what that's like because I've done some stuff where I start doing something and I keep going to the next level and the next level. She sat with a mafia guy, right? A, 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 a mob boss or something. And she almost got to go somewhere. visit them for Scarface. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which Harold was not thrilled with. <laughs> right. I mean, I just think that just because her personality was very, I think, trustworthy and she kept digging and digging, and I don't think anybody got suspicious that she was digging for the wrong reasons. They opened doors for her, so. I think she also used her library as a social center, which mm -hmm. brought lots of people into the place, and she was respected and liked, yes. and she informally talked to mm -hmm. people. I wanna say something, Raymond has been trying to talk for the longest time. Is it time for Raymond to talk? You wanna go, hell, you have to unmute yourself, Raymond. Unmute, unmute yourself. And then you can talk. Oh, thank you. I wonder if Kenneth, uh, can Kenneth and Jill see me raising my hand ever? I don't know. <laughs> I, because no, I'm I'm not shy. I, I only see I'm not speaking. Look, I'm going to grab the mic now. I'm not shy, but I don't like grabbing the mic because it, it, there's a lag when it, people grab the mic and then they get the, the right. previous version. You know what you can do there. real quick, just so that everybody knows, is if you go to... Um, there's a place where you can raise your hand on the computer screen because I'm not looking at everybody's photos. So if you, okay, well, um, I know that I you know how to raise my hand electronically hand. also. Yeah, if you hit right, the raise so, your yeah. button, that you, pops you to the top, and I see you right away. I'm sorry about that. But I say, so could I say a few things now to to yes. my piece? First of all, my overview is I loved it. Secondly, because it was a love story, and a love story for between the two the two pro protagonists, so to speak the two stars, from, from Harold to, and I also have to stop and, rem I've, I've recommended this to several people already, and I gotta stop and, and, and not say Harold and Maud, because it's not that film. It's Didn't work on that one. Lillian. Okay, so then um, it's, it's a love story towards each other, for Harold to, to Hitchcock, for Hitchcock to Harold, for Danny DeVito, who, by the way, um, was one of the executive producers, so he was probably one of the backers, so he was probably one of the instigators of making this thing, so that's why he got featured, because he availed himself of his opinion for the camera. Uh, I would have I loved it to be longer. I would have loved it to be two hours for each of them, but, but since they had 50 hours and they wanted to make it 100 minutes, 
it was it was a, a very well done as is you know like a, like an overview the love story the behind the scenes i think it was a good balance to your question kenneth uh, of personal and and because uh, I know a lot about these people now, their their trials and tribulations from their firstborn autistic child back in the day to Harold falling out of two stories and breaking a leg, to them driving in a microbus you know through through uh, Europe. So great story, feel good, loved it. Would like both of them to be longer. Would like to see more outtakes. Would like to see part two, um, and. Um, the love story from Danny to Harold, from Harold to, to art, to Harold to perspective, the, the love of perspective with a 20, 20 millimeter lens, a 50 millimeter lens. It was like so mind blowing and yet easy, easily accessible to the lay person. Um, I, I know what storyboards are and I know what research is and I love research and I'm detail oriented and I'm research and project manager and, and networker also. I, but I love the fact that she had a Rolodex which we used to say Rolodex. Um, I'm a networker, I'm a connector, and I, I'm, I love the film, and thank you very much for suggesting it. Yeah. I have my Rolodex, <laughs> just in case. Yeah, I, I agree with, with everything there that you've said. Um, one of the things, and someone else mentioned it too, that maybe they could have been a little clearer on is what the connection is with these other people, directors and things. Um, like he did work with Danny DeVito on, I think, four films. So that's one of the major ones. He worked with Mel Brooks on several films. Um, he worked with, you know, Francis Ford Coppola. And you, you get that sense, but it doesn't go deeply into like, what did he do on that movie? What did he do on, on each of the movies? Maybe that could have been made a little bit clearer. But, you know, obviously those people were interviewed. So they must have chatted with them about some of those things. Um, yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? You know, I, I didn't know anything about storyboards. I was completely blown away by this whole concept and yep. uh, really captured me. And I made a list of many of the films that were mentioned in the movie. And I went back last night to watch The Birds, which I hadn't seen in decades. Wow. And it was so much more meaningful having seen Harold and Lillian and to see the storyboards that he made for that. And I hope to go back and revisit some of the other films they made, The Graduate and Rain Man too, um, and others. I thought yeah, it was great. I, yeah, I had the same reaction. I, I had never heard anything about storyboards and it's just so fascinating that they've existed all this time and I, I didn't know anything about them. And then especially seeing the ones from The Birds and mm -hmm. from The Graduate. I mean, the gra those are movies I've seen several times in, in yeah. over the years and it was just so oh that's where that came from it was really astounding to see that so i thought it was a wonderfully done movie before we talk about some of those contributions your favorite contributions that they had um when i taught a film appreciation course one of the things i used to do was go through a, a kind of a lecture segment that was called behind the, the credits and I would go through all those credits that you never pay any attention to <laughs> and who those people are. Like, what is a Foley artist? Mm -hmm. You know, what's a focus puller and things like that. Like these people who don't really get any credit and yet are up there on the credits, but nobody knows who they are. No one pays any attention to them. You know, um, even a cinematographer, which is major. Um, a lot of people know, oh, is he like the cameraman? Well, sometimes, but not, not really a lot more than a cameraman kind of thing. So, I think this film is really good at letting you know at least two of those jobs um, that people do behind the scenes that are really important contributions, but easily are overlooked. Um, so let, let's look at the question about contributions, which was just number three on there, like favorite contributions. Um, you mentioned The Graduate. It's one of my favorite films. It may, might be my favorite film, but it's certainly in my top five films. I've seen it many, many times. And up until I saw this Harold and Lillian, I would have said that the um, cinematographer, who's Bruce Surtees, or Mike Nichols, the director, was brilliant at setting up these shots, like with the shooting through her leg, her leg, Mrs. Robinson's leg, and you know, Ben up against the the glass in the church and everything. And it turns out 
they're all Harold's right. <laughs> ideas. The brilliant stuff is all his idea. And I, I gave credit to the director and the cinematographer. Of course, they had to agree and pick the things that he did and use them and set them up and everything. But I really had no idea that somebody else had kind of dreamed up those marvelous shots. So that was a revelation to me. And I really, really enjoyed that particular one. Ben in the scuba mask, getting pushed into the swimming pool. Um, all of those shots I thought were, were really, really good. So what were some of the examples that did come out of their work that you found most interesting? Well, there. Yep. Um, I, first, before I make a comment, I wanted to ask you if you have read the script of The Graduate. I have a copy of the script. Of the okay. Book, actual copy of the copy. script, yes. Excellent. And, the, and I've read the novel. Okay. Quite Let's different. go to the script. In the script, does it, that scene where they have, they get together at the motel and they have sex, the way that was done for her getting to leave, she's very business, business wise, um, getting ready to leave, dresses, goes back and forth. The angle is of him sitting there drinking, watching TV, just like probably mm -hmm. a teenager. And she she and passes by. Forth. Is this how it was in the script? Or in the script did it say, he's watching TV while the protagonist is getting dressed and Harold came up with this great scene of having the camera steady because it told the whole story. It said a lot about the characters, how she, she's, I mean, she takes it for granted. Look, I had sex, now I'm gonna move on while he's there enjoying the moment. So how was it? The, are, you, are you familiar with that part? I'd have to look at the script again to, to be absolutely sure, but my memory of it is that in the script, it, it just simply says we see her getting dressed and she you know, crosses paths kind of thing. Um, and, you know, again, that's up to the cinematographer to set that shot up and then the editor to say, this is how we're going to cut it and that kind of thing. And I mean, I'm not taking anything away from Mike Nichols because, um, you know, things like he wanted overlapping dialogue, which is very old fashioned, like 30s kind of thing. But like you hear sound from the next scene and it kind of foreshadows or leads you into the scene and things like that. Um, which I think is, is brilliant. And obviously that's not a visual thing. So that would not have come from Harold, but um, you know, and sometimes if you look at scripts, sometimes it's just suggested, you know, it doesn't really explain it. So either it's in the storyboard or it's in the director's head that when we shoot this, I'm going to do this kind of thing, you know, and like a chase scene could just be like two, three shots of cars. How we shoot it is a whole other thing to do. So yes, yeah, that, that's a good point. Thanks. Other contributions that you really like, uh, things that they did and you saw? I, okay. I thought they commented on that, that that actually was Harold's work, that he did the storyboard with, without the head show and without the, with him just walking back and forth, that it wasn't in the script, and the director went with it. I thought that, that was discussed, actually, as part of the documentary. Well, you know, and Harold worked off scripts. He, he got scripts and was supposed right. to visualize the script mm -hmm. for the director. So, I mean, that was part of his job. So, you know, it wasn't like he making up a story. He didn't make up the story. He looked but at he, a script he, and, and saw what it said. So like, you know, you know, Benjamin goes into the swimming pool wearing frog suit, you know, um, it might say in the script. But he came up with that camera pool. angle that it would be, you wouldn't right. see her head. You would just see her walking back and forth. That's right. what I, I, they commented on that. Yeah. Um, I just have a comment about storyboard that um, as an actress, we get storyboards all the time for commercials, but even yep. doing principal work on films, I've, I've never gotten a storyboard to work on a film. So I'm wondering if it filters down to the actor level or is it just in the production, or is it more that the production people are looking at it? But at commercial auditions, the storyboards are there for everybody to see most of the time. Yeah. Um... I mean, most storyboards are generally pre-production kinds of things. And I've even had students at Montclair Film doing little films and things like that. And, you know, you have them draw their own little storyboards, you know, kind of thing. They don't have to be great artists to do it kind of thing. And that idea. But you're right. A lot of times, I mean, one of the reasons people do storyboards is because 
it save it can save money that you know if you do this pre-production work and kind of work out how it's going to look you can spend less time on the set shooting you're right for commercials you know commercials frequently use storyboards and sometimes even photograph instead of a draw kind of thing so that they know what they're doing when they get out there which is why hitchcock always said the movie's already shot you know when he goes on the set he already knows what he, the shot's going to be and how he's going to edit there's no, no no improvising going on on the set um, so other examples think, of contributions with the, with the birds that um hitchcock said picture of birds on wires and then they fly away or i thought my impression was that it was harold's idea to have it that way and then it's shot exactly that way well from what i've read um hitchcock gave harold a copy of the book i think it's daphne de, de maurier wrote the book kind of thing and said this is the book i don't know if we can do this because they didn't really have the special effects ability to um, do all these um, fancy shots with the birds and stuff. They knew they have to fake some of the bird stuff, but they also planned on using real birds. And so he said, you know, how can this be done? Read the book, look at this and see if you have some ideas. So like the scene at the school, for example, is in the book. Um, and so he was imagining what would it look like? And they said he based it on, you know, the painting um, by Edvard Munch, the, uh, the scream. He said, that's what he had in his head which is really interesting to think of that painting and think of like the woman protecting her child and running from the school kind of thing. Um, and so he sketched things out. So, and you know, Hitchcock knew he was gonna have problems with that film in production. And you know, they did use fake birds and superimposed birds and things, but there's also a famous story because supposedly um, his actress was terrified in certain scenes. The one where she goes in the attic at the house and the birds are in the attic. Those were real birds. And they were throwing birds at her and things like, like that. And she really did get like flustered and they went in her hair and cut her face a little bit and things like that. And he really wanted her to be terrified. And she was <laughs> sort of like Janet Lee with, with showers after Psycho. Not, not thrilled about showers anymore, <laughs> just happens. Other scenes that you saw that you thought were great contributions that he made to a film or ones he should have gotten more credit. Anybody pick up on the whole Cecil B. DeMille part? I found that kind of shocking and disgusting. <laughs> uh, I think Steve has a question. If you want to unmute Steve. Yeah, if you just unmute and start talking, you'll pop up. So it's good to mute in between. I don't know, Jill, can you unmute Steve on, on your side? I, don't, I, I can't, I don't think so. I can't even see Steve. Yeah, I'm trying, maybe move on. And Steve, if you can unmute, if you're able to unmute, then, um, then just go ahead and unmute. And when you get- Am I unmuted now? You're Am I unmuted? unmuted? No, yay, good. Yeah, well, this was the movie where they showed the Star Trek, Star Trek scene, isn't that right? Yeah, he worked, well, he worked on Star Trek the first, one um, as a production designer, yeah. Oh, but but it didn't show that that, that it, it said that it was all fake. They didn't say it was all fake. Um, oh, am I am I thinking of another movie? I'm not sure. I know he worked on the interior and exterior of the Enterprise. Was his production? Design. Yeah, and I, and I think the uh, somebody said the narrator said or or one of the actors said this is all fake. This is all fake. I anyway. I thought that was interesting. That's all. What do you mean? It's all fake. You mean we weren't really out in space? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Cecil B. DeMille part that got my attention, which I, I really found objectionable, was that Cecil B. DeMille, when he worked with DeMille um, on the Ten Commandments, wanted everything storyboarded. And then he didn't want Harold to be anywhere near the set. And he didn't want anyone to see or know that he was working off storyboards. He wanted all the credit for designing all these shots, like the parting of the sea and stuff like that, which I was like, okay, it's one thing not to give the guy a credit on the credits, but 
I mean, to pretend that it's all your own work, I mean, that's horrible. I thought that was a really bad thing. He had a go-between, they said. I made a note here that that he couldn't e even put things into the hands of DeMille on the set, and he could have no direct contact with this person. And yet he used almost all of his drawings for the film. That's that's beyond. <laughs> that's beyond not giving me a credit kind of thing. DeMille was Any a pompous ass. DeMille? He was. But at, compare and contrast his treatment at the hands of DeMille to Hitchcock who had just this great collaborative team around him. Remember what he said? He said, I've worked with this whole bunch and there wasn't sh one shithead in the entire group. <laughs> it was funny too how he was typecast at the beginning. He was in, uh, first he started with Ten Commandments, then Ben-Hur, then Spartacus. He said he got to the point he couldn't even remember how to draw a guy with a tie anymore. Yeah, that was that whole genre they called um... Sand and sandals or something, or swords sword and sandals? And, sword and sandals. Yeah. Anything else on films that caught you? Uh, there were a couple that I read about outside the film that I would like to have seen. Apparently, she did a lot of research for um, Rosemary's Baby on witchcraft and things like that, that she was, you know, feeding the director a lot of stuff about things they could use in incantations or anything. I thought, boy, that must have been kind of fascinating. I'd like to see who she interviewed for Rosemary's Baby, although maybe visually you wouldn't be able to see anything, but um, you know, in the research background kind of thing. I thought that would be great. Um, what else? Oh, she also worked on Chinatown. That was another one to get the period things correct for Chinatown, which that's a really good film too. I like the idea of telling the story visually and with space balls coming up with, instead of helmets, <laughs> the balls. And I said, yeah. oh my God, that is like fabulous, you know, <laughs> just visually tell, telling the story. It was a, a, good, uh, a good note. <laughs> well, I think that's how Harold actually got to move from storyboard artist to production design and art direction, because a lot of the things he was doing was actually that he was already doing it but he was just sketching it out and someone else had to build that set and things like that and so probably somebody said why don't you just come on here and help us build these sets and things like that i mean the art director is a director just like a film director except working with the sets in the background and costumes and colors and things like that i mean it could even be the choice of colors like you know we're always going to have red in particular scenes, you know, it's a, it's a red kind of feel to that and green for the other character. Um, I, I don't know where I, I just saw it recently. I don't, I don't think it was this film where Hitchcock on Vertigo. Oh, I know what it was. It was an interview with Kim Novak. And on Vertigo, they gave her this pants, not pantsuit, but a suit that she was supposed to wear. And it was, it was much too tight. It was very uncomfortable. And she told Hitchcock, she said, I, 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 can't, I can't wear this. It's very uncomfortable. And he said, that's exactly what you need to be wearing. And she said, I realized later, my character is very uncomfortable with who she is in the film. And he wanted me to literally be uncomfortable. So it was a brilliant move on his part. Okay, but you know, that's the kind of thing that directors sometimes come up with, sometimes storyboard artists come up with, sometimes art directors come up with. Okay, well, we had another question on there, I think. Let me see, what was our other question? Buried my questions here. Make sure we get to this. One second. Oh, oh. oh hold the, on. The Can number I... two question. Yeah, time Jeanette things to quick do. question. Who, who? Go Jeanette? ahead. Jeanette. Hey, hi. Jeanette. Hi. Hello. Hi. I didn't um, understand at the end of the movie that 18 page letter of the person who had the nervous breakdown. She said his name was Tim, I think, that she could talk about him because he had passed. I, I didn't know who that was. I, was. I didn't get who she was referring to. The 18 page letter where he, you know, she said she was a baby face killer. She was married to a baby face killer because she stood up for her husband when her husband was, she stood up for Harold when Harold was fired. I didn't understand who that was. You. Now I'm blanking on, on that part. I remember um, the comment, but I don't remember who it was. I remember the letter and I remember her saying she could talk about him now because he was gone. But I don't remember. I, I, I don't know his name, but I think, I think it was somebody who fired Harold. And Lillian wrote a nine page letter to him saying how wrong that was and how unfair that was and how, 
how um, it was it was a bad thing. So then that person wrote 18 pages back, and then they were all afraid of him because he was clearly unhinged. Right, so but I don't know the name. And he remains unidentifiable. Un he was the producer of the film Cross of Iron. Not the director. The director was Sam Peckinpah. Oh. Did they say that in the film, or you just know that? Well, I'm assuming he's the producer because he wasn't the director, but he was in a position to be able to fire him. And he was also treating him with great disrespect on the set and such. So he must have been a higher up there. So what was his okay. name? Don't recall. We think his and name is Ted. What, what was the Peckinpah film? Cross of Iron. Cross of Iron. Okay. So I guess we could look up Cross of Iron on Internet Movie Database and see who the producers were and say nasty things about them afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. So my, my number two question was that the filmmaker, you know, had to tie all this stuff together and he chose to do it by using storyboards, illustrations, some of which are animated and they're done by, you know, um, a modern day storyboard artist which actually the first time I saw the film, I actually thought they were using some of his storyboards, some of Harold's storyboards, like as an illustration. I didn't realize it until a little bit further in that these were made for the film. So that was his way of tying the story together. So did you, did you think that was an effective way to connect scenes? Because the film is not presented chronologically in most parts. So I think it would have been a little bit disjointed um, this is the way he decided to put it together. There are other things you could do, including the dangerous put the dates on the screen kind of thing, which is horrible, but you could do that. So what did you think of those animated storyboards that, you know, little Lillian and, and, and Harold coming in and that sort of thing? Was that effective or corny that, or what? That was one of my favorite elements of the movie. I thought it was ingenious to use that as the bridge to, from one scene to the next. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of, it was so seamless that I think unconsciously, I, th I too thought that it was Harold's artwork, which it was not. Mm -hmm. So they, they got the perfect person to tie it all together. And I think the end result was a, a damn near perfect documentary about, mm -hmm. about not just movie making, but marriage, <laughs> <laughs> fortitude. Um, I love that when I saw it a few weeks back, so I don't remember it in every little detail, but I remember when it began, I thought, do I like this woman? I'm not sure, you know, and she, she went from this very seemingly intimidated, you know, chirpy voiced lady to a powerhouse in the space of however mm -hmm. long the movie. I just was so taken with her. And when I think back on the movie, she's just as prominent in my mind, if not more so than him. I know some people had said earlier it's more about him. She just took the reins, and I loved how she handled the situation with her autistic son. I love the fact that I think Jeanette said she had the gumption to say, look, you know, I, I have nothing to lose here. I'm going to jump right on this and make something of my life. And, and I, I think that I read an interview with her where she was saying, I love the fact that I've been able to live through the centuries. She's in love with history and she's in love with everything being exact and accurate. And she's just, she's just amazing. I thought it was a great film. Yeah, you know, if, if Harold had been alive when they did the film and had been not suffering from dementia and things that's at the end, um, I have a feeling he would have taken over the film. It would have been really a film about Harold and there would have been very little bit of Lillian in it. So I, I think the fact that Lillian ends up being the only narrator interview in, in the film, I think gave her a more prominent place in the film, which she deserved. Um, but you know, there's nothing visual to show about Lillian other than the library and the, the drawers and where the location is and stuff, not like Harold's drawings and his, you know, poems that he wrote or songs and his cards and things like that. There's a lot of visual stuff for him. Um, there's not a lot. So she got the audio part of it, which I think was good. Um, I think Anyone else on the tying together? Uh, Patrizia had a 
something to say. Okay. Yeah, I I um like the fact that they didn't bring in any personal scandal into their documentary between them because I'm sure there were many times that things came up that were scandalous, not necessarily her scandal or his, but just things. And they really focused on the two careers, how strong she was, what a great artist he was, what a great historian she was. And I liked that she included her children in her narrative and uh, that one of them went in, into the field. Um, I, I thought it was so well done in terms of being a tight presentation of these two unheard of Hollywood icons. Um, I, I didn't think that it covered a lot of his interaction with stars. And, and as I said before, the um, Danny DeVito thing was very vague. I thought, why are they doing that? And then in terms of what you were talking about, the sketches, that was confusing to me. I, I thought they were his. And I thought, how could he write sketch and do these sketches about between he, he and his wife? And, and in the book, did he do those sketches in the book or did somebody else? In the book, it's him. It's him. The, yeah, the animated ones, they just asked the, a storyboard artist to do them and to approximate Harold's style, you know, the black and white style and that sort of thing, which he did. And, you know, it did fool me at first, but then, you know, I realized it's, it's impossible. It can't be his stuff because he's not alive and they're animated. Um, but I thought, I thought it was a good way to tie it together. I thought it was a kind of clever thing. And I didn't notice as much as when I was finished and watched it a second time that it's really jumbled up chronologically. I mean, there's the beginning of their bio is pretty much in order. And then it sort of jumps all over the place with their films and things. Like, like you said, with the Danny DeVito, you could have shown some shots from Danny DeVito's films that he worked on and maybe compared it or had Danny DeVito comment on, in this scene, Harold told me to do this or everything. But they didn't really push that too much. Um, and, and I like the fact that um, Jeanette just mentioned something, that the drinking came up. And she handled that in a dignified manner. You know, I, I thought, I don't think it was a perfect documentary, but what documentary is? I thought yeah. it was wonderful and it was informative and I loved learning about the storyboards. And uh, anyone who can survive in a marriage in Hollywood for that many years, the dignity has to be commended. But she yeah. also is a character study uh, and an orphan she when she said oh boy he still loves me after a year and i thought it was so humble of her to to disclose that feeling that she had and somebody mentioned that it wasn't clear why she went out to california but i think she knew what she was doing she went out to california and maybe someone else has something to say about that anyone well, I thought well, she um, didn't know. I thought she didn't know, but she was willing to, to risk it that neither of them knew. Well, he felt it would work because he was so taken with her, but I don't know. I think she was just taking a big chance and felt like she was taking a big chance. At least that's what I thought she was expressing when she talked about it. I truly, I truly admire her feistiness and her willingness to, to go for it in life. I think that, um, you know, that's always been a woman's struggle. You know, do you say, do you kind of accept the mores of the society at the time? You don't do this, you don't do that. You're an unmarried woman, you're running to California. Who, what are you doing? You know, all that, that stuff really against the family. I can throw a lot of, have a lot of respect for her. I can ask me and her willingness to take chances. Pretty cool. I think she juggled family and the professional career really well. And I think that she gave us a lot of clues that she really was keeping a lot of her family stuff private when she said that she would not let them use her son um, for Rain Man for the Dustin Hoffman movie and she gave her another reference. She told us what she wanted us to know about the family, but she kept the focus on both their, their careers. But just to give us a, a little bit to understand that, you know, it, it, she had to, to raise the child with autism and in my day job, I 
worked at special ed. So I know, you know, that that was a big job. I knew about refrigerator mother and all of that. But so, yeah, she actually, I think, focused, helped focus it or the director focused it to, to keep it on track with what they really want to show their two careers, but, but gave it um, a heart with showing them the family lives and the trials that they went through as a family too, while still managing to keep their careers, their careers going. Well, you know, when, when Jill and I were going through possible movies to use this month, um, one of the things I said was that, you know, we're doing this for lifelong learning. So if we choose film or music or whatever topic we choose for the theme, we should try to focus on people, people who have seemed to have lived a life and learned throughout their life. Um, and I, I hope in all three films, you see people going through their life and how they learned and changed and, and that sort of thing. That's kind of the, the, the second theme along with film um, that we're looking at. Um, I always look for the reviews of these films to see how they did. Um, this gets a 97 on Rotten Tomatoes, which is really good. You know, they aggregate a lot of reviews, but I always look for at least one or two negative reviews just to see, you know, what is it that somebody did not like? So I'm going to read you one of the, not so positive reviews and let's see what your reaction is since most of you liked it i think you're not going to agree with this review but we'll, we'll, we'll see let's react so it says now these are excerpts it says this cutesy love story about a married couple that put thumbprints on several hollywood classics it's a film about artistic process and the examination of the way that minor contributors make a mark on another person's work it could have been fascinating however writer director rain seems content to equate Harold and Lillian's contributions with authorship, which is insane. Unfortunately, Lillian's open refusal to discuss challenging aspects of her past limits any potential for insight, and it makes you wonder why the movie even exists if the subject of your documentary refuses to talk about her own life. You probably don't have enough material to make a feature. Ooh, harsh. So take him down a peg or agree with him or tell him why he's wrong. Anyone? Who wrote it? Who wrote it? Um, not a big, big reviewer. Let me see. It's, it's on daredaniel.com. All right. That we, for, he doesn't count. And, well, he's, can, yeah, can it's I, not the New York I, Times I, or something, but I, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's somebody's opinion. He could be somebody sitting in our group here who says, you know, I didn't like this film. I thought it was, you know cutesy and I think you know didn't get go deep enough into the story the one thing that really hits me in, in that review is that he says we're giving like Harold too much credit like he's the genius behind the graduate he's not he made a little contribution to the graduate kind of thing you know give Mike Nichols give the author you know give Buck Henry you know credit and things like that which I totally agree with but I also think that Harold and Lillian played important parts and really left the mark on these films, which no one seems to know about. The other people get all the credit anyway. You know, everybody's, you know, giving Mike Nichols credit and, you know, all these other people credit. And it's nice to know that there are other people who contribute to this. And you would hope that a director or a producer or an actor would be willing to talk about those contributions. You know, that was one thing I liked about the Mel Brooks and the Danny DeVito and stuff is that at least they're acknowledging the fact that these people played an important role in my work and didn't get credit for it. Yeah. And I think the reviewer has a backstory to make that kind of assessment because under any circumstances, it's really wonderful to learn the depth of process that goes into making a movie and the talent that is behind all of the production. I mean, I, I thought just that value was such a good choice because I had always wondered who did the costumes, who did the research, and didn't know a damn thing about the drawings because I was a stage actress and an opera singer. But, you know, it, it sounds like there was more to that review than what was on paper. The title is Harold and Lillian, a love story that should give you an indication of what it is you're going to see. And if you're not interested in a Hollywood love story about Harold and Lillian, you may leave soon because that is exactly what this was. It was very well focused. 
it was uh, told in a, a lovely way. I was very glad not to hear all the uh, stories about Lillian's harsh uh, upbringing. And so I was happy that um, they proceeded the way they did. I thought that was very well done. Well, his criticism about her not being willing to do interviews about some of the difficult stuff is exactly what somebody was commenting right before, which is what made me think of that review by saying, like, I'm glad they didn't get into the, the scandal or the horrible things like that wasn't relevant to the story. Maybe they made their marriage seem a little more perfect than it really was. OK, like you said, it's a Hollywood love story, which I take two ways. It's about people in love with Hollywood and it's about people in love with each other. And they happen to be in Hollywood. It's it's both those stories. And I thought it, it blended the two stories quite nicely, quite nicely. I, well, hello, the clock on the I, wall says. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, okay. So, I I take three issues with that review right off the bat. Cutesy is is you know annoyingly judgmental. Thumbprint is is decidedly um, minimizing both of these people's contribution to the to the whole genre, if I may. And 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 if I may, I'd like to say, in my humble opinion. Because uh, I'm not a fan of criticism. Um, I like analysis and discussion and opinion, if it's humble, frankly. And thank you for listening to mine. Uh, and, and then I used to live with a, a film critic, and some of you may know him in this area. So, oi, what a trip! Um, <laughs> and then, and then, and, and then authorship. Um, excuse me. They were collaborators, and and like like especially like we noted, Danny DeVito. Who, who was not, it wasn't clear to me if he, was, if, if he directed or produced the films that he worked with Harold on. But Harold, especially with the art, with the visuals, yes, he sometimes gave them ideas that they took. Yes, sometimes he took their ideas and put them into two-dimensional visuals. So it was collaborative, not authorship, and not thumbprint, and not cutesy. So I love the film. Um, I'm not. I'm not a fan of criticism, unquote. And thank you. I think that reviewer was from the DeMille camp. The whole idea that the uh, the director is like the god of the production and such, and everybody else is like a lower life form. You remember the credits back in the day. I mean, they used to have the cast, the producer, the director, and no one else. But now we we acknowledge, as this gentleman just said, that it is indeed a uh, collaborative effort. And that there's various different people who bring a film together. And I'm, it's great that they're having a film like this to show us these people behind the scenes who have such an influence on what we see. I agree with both those, those comments. And I don't think the director was trying to make the argument that they're the, really the authors of the great stuff in these films. Um, you know, I, I don't take any credit away from the directors and the producers and the writers who are involved in those films. His whole point, I think, is that there are lots of other people. I'm going to tell you about two people who did two particular things. I could easily do a film about other people like art directors and stuff, which he ended up doing, or cinematographers, and let you know how, you know, they contributed to a film. Um, so yeah, I totally disagree with the negative review. But, um, you know, for a little bit of controversy, we always throw in a little bit of what other people might have seen. Um, little side note, I, when I was digging through things, there's a new channel, NBC's Peacock, if you can figure out how to get it on your TV, good luck, um, but you can find it online. But I did happen to notice that one of the films that they have on there for free is Man on the Moon. So if, if you want to go back and see, you never saw Man on the Moon, but you saw the documentary, if you want to go back, it is available. You can go to PeacockTV.com and sign up. I can't get it on my television because I have Fios and they're not one of the contributing ones to Fios, but um, it is out there. Any last comments before we wrap up? Because we're a little over our time. I just wanted to say that even casting directors weren't recognized until a couple of years ago. Now they're actually being recognized and it really is a team effort to put a film together. Yeah. Casting directors is a good one. Mm-hmm. It's only a year or two, maybe two years, three years tops, that they started recognizing casting directors for awards. What an Anything amazing else? use of Claire Lelune as well. At the end of the film, 
I mean, this was a film I was laughing at out loud for a good portion of it because their observations were so witty and wry. But when they brought on Claire de Lune, which was just bringing out the melancholia and the beauty of their relationship and him, you know, her having to say goodbye to Harold. I mean, it, it, mm. it kind of teared me up a bit. It was really one of the best uses of music I've seen in a documentary. Mm. Thank you for this film. I mean, it's amazing how there's so many pleasant things that exist out there that you probably never would have found on your own, you know, um, despite all the scrolling through Netflix. Um, yeah. I found one a few weeks ago that was totally, you know, when you go out, leave the room and you get that, uh, the free, the screen of Netflix keeps flashing different movies when you leave the room. So the I carousel. Found, <laughs> yeah, whatever it's called. But there was one that's called Steal a Pencil for Me. And I looked at the screen and I went up to the TV and I read the little blurb about it. And it was about the Holocaust. I never would have found it, but it was a love story from the Holocaust where two people got separated for years and years and years and then gradually came back. And, it, you know, uh, if Netflix wasn't flashing all those things on the screen, it never would have happened. Now, Jill, I'm going to jump off a little bit here and just say that not a topic for today, but, um, you know, we had hoped to be doing these in Cinema 505 on Bloomfield Avenue live again at some point, or even doing this kind of thing live, but you know, it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen. Um, and I don't know that we're gonna continue doing this series either, but if we were to continue doing it, be thinking about um, not specifically films necessarily, but are there other themes or topics you'd like to see us do? Like we did film this time, but like if it was music, um, or, or, or some other topic that you'd like to see, you know, three films around that in a month. Um, and, you know, we've done documentaries and that's been the series that I've been doing for Montclair Film, but, you know, we could mix in a, a feature film or do all feature films or things like that. So think about it, think about it. You don't have to say anything yet and you don't have to pick out any films, just your feelings. Um, and you probably can contact Katie or something, but if anybody wants to email me thoughts on it, my email is just my last name, just Ronkowitz at njit dot edu. So Ronkowitz at njit dot edu. That's New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, just if you have thoughts on what the series could be. We, we did that with the Montclair film series and um, people wanted to see like performing arts and theater and things like that. It was a very artsy collection of films that we did, but you know, we're always looking for ideas for other films that we can do. That's it for me. Jill? Uh, no, yeah, I think that's it. Do you want to talk about um, next week's film? And then we'll have Katie send out the, the preview sheet to you guys um, in the next couple of days. Well, I'm, I'm just going to give a little warning and then I'll send out my film. So the third film is in a way similar to the first film in that it's the making of a film. And it's also like Man on the Moon. You can watch the documentary about the making of, but you could also watch the actual film. Um, and I'll talk about that in my little intro sheet when we send it out. But it's a film called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead. And it's about Orson Welles. And it's about Orson Welles making what turns out to be his, his last film, but he never finished it in his life, called The Other Side of the Wind. And it was finally finished with the help of Netflix. So The Other Side of the Wind is available on Netflix, but so is the film we're gonna look at, which is the making of it. And it's a crazy story. <laughs> it's a crazy story. But again, it's one of these, it's, it was you know, a film he shot over decades. Um, and you'll find out a lot about Orson Welles. Um, I don't know what your take on Orson Welles is. Some people think of Orson Welles as a guy who sold, you know, wine, cheap wine on television and got very heavy and went on talk shows. Um, I love Orson Welles' films. I think he was a genius director, very much mistreated by Hollywood and then caused some problems on his own. But I think it's a really interesting story about this film. So you'll, you'll get a sheet on that and we'll think about it and you can watch the documentary and or the film what's, that it's about. What's the name of the movie again? They'll Love Me When I'm Dead. They Love which, Me? They Will Love Me When I'm Dead. Oh, okay, which, thank you. Which was supposed to be something Orson Welles said because 
he felt people really didn't like him. But they will. When I'm dead, they'll love me. Wait, which order should we watch it in if we watch both? Well, that's a controversy in and of itself. But I would recommend, and I think I may have written this in my notes, um, I'd say the documentary first. And if that interests you and say, well, I'd like to see what the hell the film turned out to be, watch the film. But I think it would help you understand the film if you watch the documentary, because it's so, it's like, what do you call them? Russian dolls kind of thing. The film, The Other Side of the Wind, is about a director making a film. So some of it is documentary style and some of it is the actual film that he made. Um, the guy in the, the lead of the film is John Huston, the director is the man who is supposed to be making a film called The Other Side of the Wind. But it's like layer upon layer kind of thing. It's, it's, it's interesting, but it's, it's challenging. It's a challenge for you, this third film. So, but you'll get my notes on it and you can look it up. Maybe I don't get your watch notes. Those. I don't know why. They, they're attached to the invite with the Zoom. You should check your spam because some people, apparently it was going into their spam folder. But oh. if you really, really, if you really, really don't, email me at that NGIT address and I'll make sure you get a copy. I'll, I'll double check with Katie too and make sure that specifically they're going to you. And if anyone else is not getting them, um, just give us a heads up or give Katie a heads up. Um, we emailed them out twice last week. So once yeah. like, you know, a couple of days. I, after I don't get them. them. Yeah. Okay. We'll make sure that you get this one. Apparently, okay, if you have Comcast, if you have Comcast, it goes into spam. For whatever reason, they've changed, oh, interesting. They've changed it. So check your spam. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, sorry. We're definitely over here. So. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This is such a great discussion, and we'll I will look forward to seeing you next week.